<laughs> so let's get into today's video uh, about protein. The first thing you need to understand is that protein is not a magical substance that once you intake it, it magically turns into muscle and you get all like super jacked. It's actually not the way it goes. Uh, there's actual shit going on behind the scenes. So what is a protein basically? A protein is conformed by what are called peptides. Well, what are peptides? It's a structure conformed by amino acids and those are the building blocks of peptides. Basically, an amino acid has a carboxylic acid group, as you're probably seeing here on screen, and we have an amino group, and then we have an R chain. What does the R mean? Race. No, I'm just kidding. The R actually means that it can be different depending protein to protein. This is more of like a generic formula. But on the R, you basically can have another functional groups like an OH, you can have a sulfur compounds, you can have bases, you can have acids, you can have just straight up carbon, which is going to give the amino acid different properties depending on which uh, groups it has and in which way. That's uh, very individual for each amino acid and it's going to vary later in what we're going to talk about the structures that the amino acids form. But in terms of the generic formula, it's just straight up that an R chain and then you have the uh, carboxylic acid group and then on the other side we have the basic group which is the amino part of amino acid and that's uh, in terms of like what amino acids are and in terms of nutrition we have 20 of them and nine of them are essential that means we have to intake them via diet we can't synthesize them ourselves so it's really important that we get those amino acids so this is very important when choosing protein sources we need to make sure that we are reaching our uh, essential amino acids requirements on every single day um so it's not just protein it's what is inside the protein right we are going to get into that then you can see um as i showed you in the previous image uh, we have what is the peptide bond basically we have Let's just say here we have the amino group and here we have a, a carboxylic group and here we have the um, carboxylic group and then we have the amino right here. Basically what they do is this. They, they join and then you end up with a C terminal and an N terminal basically. And then you extend that in a linear fashion and you have a peptide which is the primary structure of proteins. And uh, then we have an image of a ribosome which is the little machine in your cells that actually produce the the peptide chain. So here we have the types of protein structures. As I already told you, we have the primary structure, which is this one. Here we have the uh, amino group, and here we have the carboxylic group, and then we have the C-terminal and N-terminal, as I told you before, um, and we have it in a linear fashion. That's it. Then what can happen, this bond right here between the carboxylic group and the amino group, and also the R chain of the amino acids, they basically have an effect that is called a hydrogen bridge, which attracts very electronegative molecules or atoms uh, to itself. And so happening is that they attract, but they don't make a bond, right? It's like a, at a distance thing. Um, so what ends up happening is that they form these structures of alpha helix and uh, beta sheet with like E, not with I. And it can be the beta sheet, it can be parallel or anti-parallel. So they're like this or like this, basically, or either facing the same direction or opposite directions between like the laminar thing. Then we have what is called the tertiary structure, which interacts mostly with the R chains of the, of the amino acids. And they have like a mix of like a uh, beta sheet and we have the alpha helix and uh, it's like a mix of this, but it's between the same uh, peptide chains. And then we have the quaternary structure uh, which is between other peptide chains, right? So uh, it can be primary, secondary, tertiary structure, and there you form um, dimers, polymers, and stuff like that, and it's like more complex structures. So that's the, the four structures that we can find in protein. Uh, just so you know what actually goes on when you intake protein, what is in protein, right? Um, and now we move on to the nutritional role of proteins. Basically, your body, all of the structures that it has, your body has a lot of nitrogen. Your body loses nitrogen with like certain metabolic functions. For example, when you go out to pee, you're losing like nitrogen, for example, just to uh, give you an idea. So what you need to do is intake enough nitrogen to reach what is uh, nitrogen balance. Our proteins have a hormonal uh, transporting a fluid balance and gene expression uh, functions and they basically operate with everything in your body to a great extent. When trying to build muscle, you don't just want to be at a nitrogen balance, you actually want to be in a nitrogen positive balance, right? You want to intake more nitrogen than you actually are excreting, not in like 
just enough, right? Not just hitting the bare minimum, a little bit more, you know, it's provided you absorb all of the nitrogen you intake. Here we have like based off of this, the question of like how much protein then should I consume to reach that positive nitrogen balance? Well, for no lifters or scum of the earth, as I like to call them, the World Health Organization uh, declares that you just need 0 0.83 grams per kilogram of body weight daily. So that's like uh, close to like 0 0.34 grams per pound of body weight for my uh, Freedom Unit users or 0 0.4 grams also approximately. That's kind of it. And you can go a little bit higher. It has been shown that you have some benefits if you are sedentary and you can take a little bit more protein. Uh, I believe that the main benefit you're going to get if you're sedentary and you can take a little bit more protein, not a lot, just a little bit more, is that you're going to be more satiated with less calories. And we're going to get into that. Also, you may experience some body recomposition because of that. And you're going to have a higher thermic effect of foods. And another cool thing about like high protein foods is that uh, they either come with a lot of nutrients, right, like minerals and vitamins, especially water-soluble vitamins, uh, they usually come with that. Uh, in the case of, like, for example, you have your legumes, you have, um, basically, following with that, fiber, which, in general, high-protein foods tend to be very satiating, so if you want to lose weight fairly easy, um, you just eat higher-protein foods, so that can be good for a cut, although bad for a bulk, which we're going to get into. I'm getting way ahead of myself today. So... For now, lifters, 0 0.83. Um, 0 so for now, so for now, lifters, 0 0.83 grams uh, per kilogram is just fine. For lifters, aka autistic people, we need double that. 1.6 grams uh, per kilogram, which is basically 0 0.8 grams per pound of body weight, or 0 0.7 approximately. You can go higher, yes, but again, you won't get like maximize benefits you just get a little bit more satiety especially when you are like uh consuming this high amount of protein already uh you're not going to get that much benefit someone that is sedentary and just needs 0 0.8 grams and uh then they intake a little bit more like 0 0.9 or even one gram per kilogram they're going to see a lot of benefits it's like an asymptote uh the higher your protein you go the less benefits you get and at one point you start even to get negative effects on your body because you start uh getting some issues uh with uric acid so uh, beware of that. Just hit your goal. And that's it. You don't need to over obsess with protein. This is what you need. You don't need more. How do you get your protein then? You need to, you need to hit a certain goal. How do you get it? Well, you have your protein sources, as I alluded to before, and you have two main camps. We have your animal sources, and then we have our plant sources. So let's go one by one and see the benefits and the disadvantages of each one. The first thing we're going to go is with plant sources of protein. We have our soybeans, soy, soy products, like your tofu, your TBP, your hydrolyzed protein powders, the peas, the same thing, uh, lentils, beans, peanuts, in some capacity, cereals, like your pasta, your rice, it has some protein in it, and it actually has some synergy with legumes, which, again, we're going to get into that. So... Uh, the first advantage is that they're cheap as fuck. So you can go into a supermarket, get a shit ton of these uh, protein sources or very cheaply. And not only that, they're easy to like store because you don't have to freeze them because they have a low water content. So you just leave them there in a non-humid place and you're fine. They're not going to spoil. They are very nutrient dense because for example, with beans, you not only have protein, you also have fiber, you also have... Uh, folate, you also have uh, B vitamins. Uh, there's a lot of nutritional benefits, especially with legumes, um, alongside the protein you get. So that's really good. It's easy to meal prep. What I mean by that is that you just boil them, store them in the freezer, you separate like the portions, right? And you store them in the freezer and that's it. And then when you need them, you just reheat them and they're brand new. Like they just, you just cook them. On top of that, they are very versatile. You can include them in pasta. You can include them in your salads. You can you can get like meat imitations, right? And uh, you can get like, for example, with TBP, you can substitute ground beef by TBP and it's going to be basically the same because of all of the sauces you usually use when uh, cooking with ground beef. So amazing in that regard. Then we are going to talk about the cons. So Basically, they have a lower protein score. They don't rank as high as animal protein as we're going to see in a second. Uh, that means that they have a lesser biological value and or worse um, profile of amino acids. Remember when we talk about the essential amino acids? Well, this is uh, one thing that the plant proteins actually 
fail to achieve, which is to have a complete uh, profile of amino acids. The next thing is that uh, meat not only has protein, it has also vitamins, especially B12, which you really can't get via plant sources. This is a con for uh, plant products and you have to supplement with B12 in the case that you're not going to consume any type of animal products. Some of these protein sources also are kind of high carb. That's the issue with like plant sources of protein. Usually you have protein and other things, right? You have, for example, peanuts. Peanuts have a good amount of protein, but they have a lot of fat with it. And they have high biological value, that's true, but they also have like a shit ton of fats and especially omega-6s, which there's nothing wrong with omega-6 fat. It's just that um, you need also your omega-3s to counterbalance that. And if you don't get them via diet, you're kind of screwed, basically. And also, if you don't know how to cook, uh, you're going to have a bad time when it comes to plant sources of protein because they taste bland as shit if you don't know how to cook. And another aspect of plant sources of protein is that you need to mix plant sources of protein with one another. Legumes with cereals. Because legumes are lower, basically they are low in uh, methionine and uh, tyrosine. The cereals are low in lysine, so they kind of complement each other in that regard, so they fill each other's uh, holes. Based on what I just said, I found like a couple of studies and I just quoted uh, one here uh, or cited because it's scientific research oh, that basically people on plant-based diets should uh, increase their protein intake by 10 to 20 grams, especially if you are like someone who does physical activity to compensate for the lower quality of amino acids you're getting because that's another aspect. You struggle to extract protein from plant sources because they usually form complexes with fiber. Uh, then we go to the chat animal sources of protein. We have basically your mom, uh, fish, beef, chicken, eggs, milk, uh, either whole or skimmed, other animals of your choosing. If you're Chinese, you might consider eating bats, something like that. Um, and then let's talk about the pros and cons. So the prawns, uh, so the pros is that they're packed. Also prawns are uh, a good source of uh, protein. Uh, so the pros uh, is that they're packed with super high quality protein. They're like complete. And not only that, they're very like are absorbed to a high 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 degree so, so for the pros um they're packed with super high quality protein so you have a complete profile of amino acids you're going to absorb most of it uh, they're not going to be in complexes with like fiber if it is high quality for example you bought like pasture raised eggs or you bought like a grass-fed beef you're basically going to get omega-3s with that which is amazing and you're going to get very bioavailable omega-3s because you have the plant version and animal version and taylor's version so you have your plant version of omega-3s uh, which is ala alpha linolenic acid there we go and the thing with this one is that it has it has basically a conversion rate. I think it was 0.013% to the bioavailable version, which is the HA and EPA, which is super low and is basically zero. <laughs> then with the animal version, you straight up have DHA and EPA, right? So you just intake it and that's it. You, you get your omega-3s in a bioavailable fashion. Uh, especially if you eat a lot of fish, I recommend eating a lot of fish. That's a lot of fish. Especially river fish because they're usually very cheap and they have a high amount of omega 3s. And they also don't get fed a weird diet that disrupts the omega 6 to omega 3 ratio of the fish. It's amazing. <laughs> Super fucking easy to make it taste good. Um, so then we move on to the cons, which uh, they're basically more expensive, way more expensive. Um, they have uh, high water content, so they're very hard to store and you need to refrigerate them uh, because of its high water content. Once you freeze it, even if you like, if you cook it beforehand and then you freeze it, once you unfreeze it, heat it up and you're ready to eat, you're going to realize that it's no longer meat, it's rubber. So you're chewing on rubber. Also the ethical concerns of like, uh, I'm damaging the environment and all that hippie shit. Yeah, let's move on to the next thing, which is basically the score. Uh, we usually use to determine the value or the quality of a protein and as you can see the animal like product just straight up mop the floor with the like the plant sources be it the pdcaas which uses i'm going to explain it in a second and uh, the diaas basically um, which is another method which they are very similar but they are different same same but different same same but different so here we can see the, the table and again, animal products just mop the floor in terms of quality. Now, 
I'm going to explain the scores. Uh, it's not that complicated. You basically compare for the PDCAs, you find the limiting amino acid, the one that is in the lowest proportion, and that then you compare it to uh, a reference you have. With that, you then correct it by its digestibility factor in terms of fecal matter of rats, and uh, that you multiply by 100, or in this case they didn't, but you can multiply by 100 to get a percentage, or just get the factor of like 0 point da da da. And out of that, you get the PDCAA score. Then with the other one, which is the digestibility indispensable amino acid score, the DIS or DIAAS, uh, you basically do the same, but with every individual amino acid. That's the first thing. And then you compare it with the ileal digestibility, which is more accurate because in the ileal, you that's where you absorb uh, the protein the most. And uh, it makes more sense than to use fecal matter. So with that, you have like the two scores. One goes up to 100 and the other one goes up to 144. And they're used to estimate quality protein, basically. Then out of that, with all that I explained, we can make like a pseudo protein tier list, if you will. Uh, the, the criteria that I would have to make this uh, protein tier list. The ratio between uh, protein and energy is very relevant, uh, so previously uh, said. Um, and there you have a guy that I used to follow. Uh, he's a very biased when it comes to his opinions, but the concept I got it from him, which is Dr. Tech Naiman, um, which is the PE ratio, it's going to allow you to make a better guess for which source of protein will fit your needs better. For example, if you're cutting, you may tend to choose leaner proteins or proteins that are higher in fiber and lower in energy, uh, like for example, more towards lentils instead of beans or more towards peas. Uh, and soy and stuff like that, uh, or chicken breast over ribs, for example, or eggs. Then you also need to take into account the price, protein to the price. Uh, that's where plant proteins shine mostly because, again, you don't need a lot of protein, but with plant proteins, you can get a shit ton of protein for a very cheap price. Yeah, you have to eat like 20 grams extra to make up for the lower like bioavailability, but like at the end of the day, you can buy like probably twice as much uh, plant protein as you can uh, animal protein. Uh, you also need to take into account the nutrient density. Something I didn't mention is that uh, plant sources of protein also, yeah, I know they, they have a lot of issues, right? They're like a girl without a dad. They have a lot of issues. Plant sources of protein, what they have is anti-nutrients, right? For example, soy has trypsin inhibitors and uh, lentils and peas and stuff like that have saponins, I think they're called in English. I'm going to, if, if I said it incorrectly, I'm going to put here a correction. Um, but basically what they do is they prevent the absorption of protein. That's basically it. I can remove it by doing certain things, like for example, soaking the lentils and soaking like the, the peas and stuff like that reduces the content by a lot. Cooking um, the, the legumes as well reduces the anti-nutrient content. So ev everything is not bad with like pro uh, plant sources of protein. Based off what I just explained, we have our protein uh, source tiers, if you will. We have the S tier, which we have soy. Cheap as fuck, it's high in protein, uh, very low in, in the rest of the energy. It has isoflavins, which a lot of people say it's going to turn you into a femboy. Oh shit, damn, you looking real cute. What's your name? My name is Felix. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> I'm killing myself. <laughs> it's not going to, you're actually uh, going to get a lot of benefits because isoflavins have a lot of anti-cancer properties. And on top of that, they have been shown to reduce cardiovascular risks and uh, improved health overall, right? Isoplavins are pretty cool. Uh, then we have TBP, which is a byproduct, uh, not a byproduct, which is a product made out of soy. Uh, eggs, because I believe that eggs are super nutrient dense. They have, uh, although a lot of cholesterol, uh, they have also all of the vitamins your body needs in a very bioavailable fashion. And on top of that, the protein of eggs is like the, the most bioavailable thing you can find on the planet alongside whey protein. Uh, we have powdered milk, um, then you have chicken, and uh, you also have the protein powders, anyone, be it vegan or not. Then we have the A tier, which is pork, beef, chicken, uh, the meats basically, milk, be it e UHT or pasteurized, I mean it in like a liquid form. Do not drink raw milk. I, I, I can't believe I have to say this, but do not drink raw milk. Uh, then we have the B tier, which is the non-oil seeds and peanuts. 
Uh, you have your peas, your lentils, you have your peanuts and stuff like that. I call them B tier because they're not as good as meats and their protein scores are way lower than soy. And then we have peanuts, which they're amazing in terms of their uh, amino acid profile, but then in terms of like protein to energy, that's where they fall apart because they have a lot of fat. Then on C tier, we have chickpeas. So fuck chickpeas, I'm not going to elaborate. Then on D tier, we have any vegan processed meats. And then we have the F tier, which is the Connor Morphe Divine Protein Shake, which again, I will not elaborate. Might be better than chickpeas actually. You can switch them uh, in the tier list. It's C tier is the Connor Murphy one. And on F tier, we have chickpeas because fuck chickpeas. I hate them. Then we have finally to conclude my recommendations, which is consume uh, a, a variety of sources of protein. Um, I would actually, in terms of cost, I would actually prefer you to eat more vegetable protein and have a mix of proteins throughout the week. Like don't just eat, for example, beans and that's it, right? Or don't just eat soy. One day you have soy, the other day you have um, ground beef, the other one you have eggs, the other one you have uh, lentils, you have, um, for example, I don't know, rice with, uh, with peas or something like that. Another day you have liver and so on and so forth, you rotate them through just so you can get a variety of nutrients alongside the protein and you can get everything your body needs while still saving costs, basically. Don't obsess over protein. 0.7 grams per pound is where the benefits are capped. So it's not that once you reach 0.7, the, the benefits start increasing. It's just that here it's where it's stuck. Um, so as long as you get that in the general ballpark, so you, you oh no, I got 0.6 gram per, uh, per pound today. It doesn't matter. You got 0 0.8, great. Yeah, 0 0.5, doesn't matter. Again, uh, as long as you have a general like intake of protein, you're going to be fine. Go higher in protein while cutting just to retain as much muscle as possible and also to be as satiated as possible and uh, lower when bulking. When bulking, I would actually recommend you to go a little bit lower in terms of 0 0.5 grams per pound of body weight, just so you can like uh, reduce the tidy as much as possible. And because of uh, you being in a high calorie surplus or higher calorie surplus than just uh, main gaining, right? Uh, you don't need as much protein as some of it is main gaining or recomping. You need way less because uh, you're basically priming your body to be more anabolic by default. You're incentivizing the anabolic pathways way more. So that's basically it. Then uh, I would say to avoid buying, uh, buying like protein powders and stuff like that. Since the amount of protein required is so low, you're better off just buying more food with that because you're going to get more nutrients, you're going to get more fiber, you're going to get more uh, fats, more carbs, and you're going to be able to have a complete diet instead of just protein, you know? And lastly, uh, for my intermittent fasters, you may want to consume more protein overall. So you want to increase the amount of protein content you're intaking because you're spending a lot of time without any source of like protein. Because remember, you're not going to be able to fully utilize uh, protein one sitting compared to six. Uh, I will explain in a future video how uh, to use protein when intermittent fasting. Expect that video in the future. And uh, yeah, we have reached the conclusion that protein is an essential nutrient that we need to intake and that it accomplishes a lot of biological functions and that we need to be careful with what types of protein we are intaking in terms of balancing the amino acid profiles, the cost, and the nutrients that come alongside it. So uh, thanks for watching. And I want to tell you that now I reward my buy me a coffee. And now instead of uh, buying memberships, you can donate. And once we reach the indicated goal, I'll release a free program pack basically for my audience. And those that donate it because they put in money, they are going to get a customized version of one of the programs of the program pack. So for example, it released plyometrics, high reps, um, I don't know, hybrid and um, two more, right? And you donate and we'll reach the goal, I release the program pack and you get to choose among one of uh, the five, which customized program do you want? And then I send it to you. And you get a free call in which I explain to you the program and I give you notes and exercise cues and stuff like that. It's basically like coaching light, if you will, the same way you have Instagram light. Um, but you just have to donate at least $5. So amazing. Um, so yeah, guys, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave me your thoughts in the comments below. Leave a like. And um, 
tell me what you yeah tell me what you think in the comments below i'll be happy to read your comments thanks for watching